called Imagining a New World, the Labor of Peace, if I may. Ten years ago, in November 2012, during the inaugural ceremony where I was officially made the third holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace, I began my lecture with the following observation. The aspiration for achieving peace has been a central concern throughout human history. Generation after generation, men, women have longed for, struggled for, perished for peace. In the 20th, 20th century alone, it is estimated that some six million children, women, and men lost their lives as a result of war and genocide. Even in this, the 21st century, the human rights of more than three billion people, about one half of the world's population, are not protected. Unfortunately, little has changed in the world since this statement was made 10 years ago. And during that time, the world has only grown more complex and interconnected. The reach of social media and the influence of global politics, the impact of natural disasters, and global health catastrophes, and more broadly, the fundamental interwovenness of all of us has only increased. Today, every positive or negative change that takes place is felt throughout the world. The depth and breadth of the interconnectedness of the world cannot be denied. However, the lack of governmental capacity and the inability of our social institutions to accommodate the ongoing changes is a serious threat to our peace and security. The world is getting smaller, yet inequality, suffering, fragmentation, and disorder are increasing. What are we to do in the face of such challenges? Since the creation of the Baha'i Chair 30 years ago, we have maintained an enduring, unshakable belief that world peace is possible. This belief animates all that we do and spurs us to seek excellence in education, research, and publishing, and helps unveil the pathways to peace. And because the demands of peace are so serious, we seek a holistic, integrative approach to pursuing peace. This approach views the peoples of the world as a single inclusive organic unit, much like the human body. For just as the human body is made of constituent organs that work together in harmony, so too must our world be coordinated and harmonized if the whole is to function properly. This view causes us to seek an interdisciplinary approach to the social problems of the day, problems which block the pathways to peace. Our approach is process-oriented and inclusive and draws insights from our shared human values those ethical and moral realities we all share. We believe that these shared values provide the foundation for cooperation and collaboration. And as such, we are firmly devoted to building such a foundation. In the previous 10 years, the chair has collaborated and invited, as you heard, many scholars, some 250, we've had We've hosted conferences, lectures, roundtables, symposia, and featured speakers from 25 countries around the world. We've offered courses, uh, one on the problem of prejudice, which won an award, one on um, the, uh, is, is world peace possible, uh, is, is global governance and world government uh, at what is needed to make the world more peaceful, is the second course. And during the past year, we have published seven books, and an eighth one is on the way, entitled Women and Inequality in a Changing World, Exploring New Paradigms for Peace. More than 10 visiting scholars have worked alongside the chair. These scholars have published six books and more than a dozen articles. 
And in 2019, the chair received an award from the University of Maryland for outstanding work on issues of structural racism awarded by the President's Commission on Ethnic Minority Issues. Of course, we are proud of the awards and the recognition, but we are most proud to be engaged in the ongoing, daily, often unseen task of grappling with the world's most complex questions. Questions like, what is the pathway to a successful model of global governance? What is the best way to remove the attributes of structural racism and prejudice? How can we increase the visibility and viability of women in the world? What can we do to address the concerns facing our natural environment? And finally, how can we better understand ourselves and each other? But perhaps all these questions and many more can be summed up with one broad question, a kind of question of questions, which is, how might we imagine a new world? The most important aspect of this question is not the word we. I'm sorry, it is the word we. <laughs> the question does not ask how I might change the world, nor how you might change the world, but rather how we, how we might imagine a new world. Also encased in this question is the view of humanity as a fundamentally capable humanity, capable of great things. One would not ask so bold a question if one did not think change were possible. But viewing humanity as fundamentally capable does not mean that we view the world through rose-colored glasses. We are very aware that there is evil in the world and in fact spend a great deal of time on the heaviest issues in the world. Our five themes, discrimination and prejudice, the equality of women, the harm done to the environment, the perplexities of human nature, and the failures of global governance. But these five themes are not just guidelines or things we are interested in talking about. These five themes represent the tectonic ruptures that divide us we examine these ideas because these are where the problems are. We do not examine these ideas to simply focus on the negative. Instead, we examine these issues in order to identify where certain practices and undertakings have been successful. We then look to see how these approaches can be reiterated in different places. We are sunny about the possibilities of change, but we are sober-minded about the complexity of the world and the existence of evil. We are always looking for an alignment of social and moral and ethical interests, and we believe indeed we have seen over time that such an alignment is possible. We refuse to consider the notion that a better world cannot be constructed. For we can see historically and in fits and starts, progress has been made. Our optimism is therefore not a metaphysical, hands over the eyes, unscientific optimism. Rather, it is an optimism rooted in empirical reality. Because we believe this, we are ever eager to contribute to the cause of peace. The Baha'i Chair looks to provide a platform for the solutions to the problems of peace, which show the most promise. And while this search is very much a human undertaking, it is also a scientific undertaking. For the pursuit of, no of peace is not simply I hope it all works out set of practices. It is a complex process of testing hypotheses in the search for the best results in the social world. In so doing, we believe we are aligning ourselves with the best principles that the university's pursuit of knowledge offers. 
we look to build on the fundamental truths and vital discoveries of the human population while identifying, celebrating, and sharing its most valuable achievements. This ongoing search for humanity's best practices is our method for creating peace in the world. We are interdisciplinary because modern life can only be understood from multiple perspectives. We are not simply interdisciplinary for the sake of being interdisciplinary. We never assert that we know more than others. For we too are continually engaged in an ongoing learning process. We too work hard to remain in a learning posture. For unlike a think tank on a particular side of a political debate, we are not looking to find the be best practices for a particular side. Rather, we are looking to build a storehouse of human knowledge, human accomplishment, and human possibility. We accomplish this in part through an old-fashioned notion, disinterestedness. But disinterestedness does not mean uninterested. It means seeking to put away our own inclinations and predilections for the pursuit of a greater cause. We want to do everything we can to unearth the practices which aid humankind no matter their origin. Do we have a particular interest, preference, particularity? Of course we do. Is there anything wrong with possessing a certain viewpoint? Of course not. But we believe in the human value of seeking to temper one's own perspective, and we wish to avoid the pride of thinking that we have it all figured out. Such a stance ensures that we can stay curious, humble, and open to new ideas, all the while refraining from pressing our own views upon others. For we believe that when people or institutions have undeclared agendas, they give off the aroma of a provincial bent towards a predetermined outcome. When this happens, the path has already been decided, regardless of if it is the best way to go. We seek instead to help illuminate a path to the universal pursuit of knowledge and truth. We believe that peace can only be achieved when there is an openness to new solutions and we seek to assemble a storehouse of intellectual, social, and spiritual possibility. Assembling a broad archive of knowledge and insight means avoiding divisiveness and predetermination. And assembling such an archive is only the first step. One still must research the best ways to take all of that knowledge and bring it into the world to impact others. And even that impact is not set in stone, but is ever changing. A solution to something today may not work tomorrow. For the vectors of cultural change and social evolution demand solutions to be updated, preserved, and sometimes even discarded. Therefore, we do not only seek ways to impact the world, but we study how current attempts to impact the world are faring. This is yet another reason why we work and the work of peace is so difficult. The scale of the challenge is absolutely breathtaking in its complexity. And our standard for achievement, a fully collaborative effort involving every human being on Earth, will not come easily. We know this. It should come as no surprise, then, that with such an important calling, the manner in which we seek to build collaborations must also be soaked in the considerations of peace. For the chair does not look to create a mind colony of others' information. 
It seeks to locate a neutral ground where we can learn together, apply principles together, reflect on what we've applied, and then chart a path forward. It is a collaborative, collective endeavor, and we look to position ourselves as an intellectually unaffiliated arbiter of best practices. This is not to say we do not have an agenda at all. We do have an agenda. But our agenda is singular, and it is broad, and it is plainly declared in our name. Our agenda, our goal, our pursuit is world peace. In that undertaking of that agenda, we are open to anyone and anything. We are not looking to prioritize one group, one approach, one historical outcome. We work with a sense of all hands on deck, and we seek to let the best ideas emerge. But in seeking the best ideas, it becomes clear how the best ideas are often obstructed. We therefore seek to understand the pitfalls and obstructions that stop the best ideas from being implemented. We also begin to recognize the patterns of bad ideas and bad practices that prevent further growth of peace. We believe in examining history we believe in examining history that one can see the repetition of poor practices which undercut our ability to achieve a broader peace, an outcome not unique to any particular society in the world. From Europe to Asia, to Africa to the Americas and beyond, the failure of human societies to create a lasting, enduring peace is universal. One can therefore conclude that these failures are not the failures of a particular culture or nation, but are profoundly human failures. Such a sad state of affairs can be viewed everywhere in the world. And everywhere, certain malign influences repeat themselves. Divisions that ensure that ethnic minorities remain behind the wall of prejudice and discrimination an inability to empathize with others or to even understand our own human nature, the failure to embrace the role of half of the world's population, women, a slowness in comprehending the need for global responses to human governance, a tacit approval of the degradation of our natural environment. This is why we seek peace and this is why we desire, it must be said, the absence of peace. Because the absence of peace leaves our world threadbare and half achieved, ensuring that we will not reach our full potential. The absence of peace chokes the garden of our flowering humanity from its true bounty and beauty. The absence of peace forces us to repeat same old mistakes, even though they appear in a variety of different disguises. For the good will always be challenged by the forces of evil. And there will always be weeds which seek to grow in the garden of peace. This is why we work, why the work of peace demands the slow cultivation of what is good and the careful pruning of what is bad. For as many know, gardening is hard work. Those of you who garden will know and relate to this. It requires thoughtfulness and dedication and an embrace of natural limits of what is truly possible. Coconuts do not grow on Mount Everest. Birch trees do not grow in the Southern Hemisphere. Weeds allowed to run wild will choke the roses. Carelessly ripping out budding plants erase other good things in the garden. The wisdom of the garden and of the gardener is a lived wisdom, a wisdom of practice and personal investment. 
and the gardener's activities can seem both foolhardy and overcautious. Foolhardy for focusing on so prosaic a goal. Overcautious because we may think that the gardener has lost courage because of his patience or her patience. Gardeners are bold to assume that they can shape the world for the better, that they can help to produce something beautiful. And gardeners are careful to understand that it is easier to destroy something than to build something. Gardeners may read books, but there is something special that happens when fingertips touch dirt. Likewise, the work of peace is not a call for new theories and new philosophies. The search for peace is the search for people, anyone willing to do the work of peace. And it is work anybody can do. A peace that involves all humanity, where every individual is involved, where expertise is shared, ensures a robust peace that has an opportunity to endure. For peace is not so much a proposal as it is a recognition, a recognition that nowhere in the world has peace fully blossomed. Sadly, we know peace more from its absence than its presence. All societies everywhere in the world since the beginning of time have only known peace as an infrequent visitor. Humanity has never enjoyed full, collaborative, fully peaceful, universal peace. Sadly, the world has always been at war with itself. Powers rise, emerging in glory, only to slowly fade away. Without a commitment to a fundamentally different undertaking, such a state will repeat itself forever. One may invent a new ism, a new undertaking, a new form of government, a new political theory, a new social philosophy, but it will not last. It cannot last. It has never lasted, and it never will, unless there is a radically different approach. This is for us what peace means, a radically different approach to human living that must be undertaken. Peace is the opposite direction of the wall that humanity continues to hit its head upon and has done so for thousands of years everywhere in the world. What is lovely about this description of peace is that talking about peace this way, as dark and depressing as it is, also requires a moment of realization and a determination to look another way. What's beautiful about this reality is that this assertion of peace does not prefer the Greeks more than the Romans, the Aztecs more than the Persians, the French more than the British. We can look at all these places and all these people and see wonderful things and terrible things but we can see that even in the greatness of society, there has never been a sustained peace. Against this backdrop, what are the chances peace will spontaneously occur or that we can repeat the activities of the past to accomplish what has never been accomplished before, even by the most brilliant human beings on the face of the earth, the most accomplished societies in history? I would say the chances are zero. But perhaps that zero is also a good place to start. Perhaps peace itself can be thought of as a year zero, the first step in a long journey. As participants in peace, we are thoughtful about where we step but we are also relieved of the burden of knowing fully where we are going because no one has figured it out to date. But if we have not discovered the golden road of peace, 
we have come to understand some of the hindrances on that road. But hindrances can also be revealing. Thus the chair examines the pursuit of peace throughout history, seeking to learn from the failures of peace. For just as the Wright brothers, the inventors and uh, builders of the world's first flying airplane, just as the Wright brothers comprehensively studied the reasons why planes one, two, and three didn't fly, we too can seek to understand why peace has not reigned throughout humanity. For the Wright brothers' failure was not depressing. In fact, they viewed it as quite informative. With each failure, they moved towards a hopeful end and looked to modify and improve their approaches. Failure, when a great undertaking is occurring, is a kind of success. Yet those who would seek a great undertaking must constrain themselves within a studied method. In our case, we seek not a flying machine, but a global universal peace. And the mixed data sets of success and failure abound. There have been places which have made extraordinary steps to create democratic processes and collaborative practices, but did not involve particular cultural groups in their effort. Other societies have created principled cultures which upheld justice, but failed by not embrace, embracing women's abilities. This long process of examination, a kind of continuum of human scientific discovery, holds promise for us all. Such a study reveals something positive about our essential humanity, our innate, insatiable curiosity, our dis deep desire to understand how the world works and therefore how to find our place in it. For whether we are building a house, a flying machine, or a peaceful society, the same thoughtful practices, the same attention and intention, and the same curiosity must be present. It is intellectual, it is intellectual curiosity and desire that led people to preserve ancient manuscripts during the Middle Ages. We too, at the chair, want to preserve the greatest peaceful accomplishments of our era and of the eras before. For just as those preserved manuscripts from Greece, Rome, and the Islamic world once discovered cast a whole new light by revealing knowledge that had been forgotten, we too seek to add to the warehouse of human knowledge that could one day be rediscovered, especially when dark times are entered into. And dark times are not simply overcome by satisfying of material needs. Dark times are overcome by spiritual insight, by a lofty and principal idea, the remembered past, and even by beauty. This is because peace is not simply the absence of something ugly, but the presence of something sacred, something sacred within us, and something sacred within the world. Now such sacredness need not be enjoined by an intermediary. Such a pursuit can be undertaken by anyone. The question then becomes, how do we engage in such a pursuit? Today we live in a world that is profoundly insular and individualistic, a world that encourages us to go and make our own separate dreams. Here in the United States, for instance, People come from all over the world to try to achieve their dreams, and not just as individuals, but as families and as communities. They seek to take full advantage of the freedoms of opportunities offered here, to lay out their own claims to a broader, better humanity. Indeed, the world of these dreamers created, the world that these dreamers created has forged a beautiful American mosaic 
one of possibility and of moral, ethical, and familial accomplishment. Thus, one could reasonably say that the first engagement toward peace begins with the individual. But it does not stay there. For the prospects of moral accomplishment is a kind of self-evident faith and ethical assertion that animates so many of us, whether religious or not, from every culture, from every country, and every background. And moral accomplishments cannot occur in a vacuum. Values like love, steadfastness, goodness, stamina over time, courage, valor, and selflessness occur in the world with people. They happen when we are fully enmeshed and involved in, with real human communities. And I'm coming to the end. Here is the beginning of our great call, a call to the best of ourselves, a call to the best of each other. This call is not limited by race, culture, gender, creed, or natural ability. It is a personal call, one that will not always be intelligible to others. But its privacy does not demean its reality and its demand that we enter into relationships with others does not mean that we ought to abandon the care for our own souls. For it is in this caring for our own souls that we become convinced that we ought to uh, treat others the same. A loving interior flows to a loving exterior where we can enjoy the fruits of love and friendship. Peace begins at home, as it were, in the heart. Peace, like love, cannot be packaged and bought, but it can be invested in. And that investment begins with a commitment to the construction and preservation of our own inward worlds. As Baha'u'llah states, a person must before all else conquer with the sword of inner meaning and explanation the city of his own heart and guard it. Our first solemn duty is not to improve the world, but to seek to improve the city of our own heart. Such a commitment is a sacred trust and an affirmation of our own human dignity. It means accepting that there is an indivisible core within, beyond the prying eyes of others that remains resolute, unbreakable, unreachable. This is the foundation of our practice, of our activities, and of our faith in ourselves and each other. This foundation is absolutely necessary if we are ever to be able to go beyond the city of our own hearts and encounter the cities of others. Indeed, Baha'u'llah states that we must proceed in this way, for even scientific undertakings must have a bedrock of accepted truth, an immovable, unchangeable assertion. In geometry, a line and a point are used to build theories and proofs, but are themselves neither proven or disproven. They are accepted as universal, built into the fabric of all that comes next. The question for us then is what are our universal assertions? The peace, the building blocks to our faith and practice, what do we believe? We at the Baha'i Chair believe that human beings are worth saving, that they have dignity for reasons that do not extend to the purpose they enact. We believe there is an indivisible sacredness to every human being. We believe that peace and the desire for peace and the work towards peace ascends from a private commitment to an inward devotion. 
We believe that human beings sacred of their own accord are never capable of improvement. For if one person is capable of improvement, several people are capable of improvement. And if several people are capable of improvement, many are capable of improvement. If one can change, all can change. And if a world can grow worse, it can grow better. But how might this occur? By thoughtfulness, by consideration, by choices, by attention, by intention, by surrounding ourselves with good narratives, by reminding ourselves that what humanity has accomplished. And we have witnessed this. We have witnessed others with much less than us hold on to a valuable ideal and build themselves up with it. This is a good sort of individualism. It proceeds from a place that says, I'm going to do my part to improve myself, but at some point I'm going to need help. I will align myself with things that are helpful to me, but I will need you to do your part. And this is where I believe the Baha'i chair and other grand ventures come in. Our part is to, our part is to build a knowledgeable archive and to cast about for the brightest pathways to peace. And let us remind ourselves of what peace really is and what peace really means. Peace is one human soul seeking to improve herself. Peace is all of us, everywhere. Peace starts with you, it starts with me today. But it does not end there. The processes of peace are slow, ongoing, and deeply, deeply personal. Peace cannot be achieved in a day and may not be achieved in my lifetime or yours. But the processes of peace, and even more importantly, the yearning for peace, is our most human attribute. In choosing the paths of peace, we choose the best of all we are and the best of all we can be. For in choosing peace, we lay the first stone towards the construction of a new world. And the laying of the stones of peace fires the imaginations of those today and those to come. But simply to imagine peace is to imagine a new world. The successes of peace will come from all of us, and us comprised of the fellowship of the willing. The work of peace will come from a collaboration of those dedicated to toiling in unison regardless and regardful of the past while being fully in the present and with a mind to the future. We invite you to help us imagine such a new world of peace. Thank you.